So as I'm downloading mine test, um, I'll be I'll start reading the 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 article, the post about uh, creating infinite worlds with quantum computing. Um, so this is within the the projects review uh, playlists and on, on the channel because this is one. Um, project from uh, James Wooton, uh, where he basically generates, uh, using quantum computing, generates maps randomly. Um, I, the then can, they can, so procedur procedurally generates maps uh, randomly. You can flag them, uh, you can f you, you can kind of uh, more or less mark where you want grass, where you want certain certain types of terrain, and then it would just randomly generate those uh, those things. Um, and so I'm, I was just curious, just curious to see how how is that how is that that all done, and um, just to play with it a little bit, see see what's what's up, because the idea is you can then feed that into mind test and actually see this really working. Um, Let's see. So from 1980s rock to recent games like No Man's Sky, random generated content has become an important part of game design. The techniques is, for these are far more sophisticated than just coin flips, since the content they provide needs to satisfy an array of complex solutions. For example, random generated puzzle needs to be solvable, uh, random generated level needs to be completable, random generated terrain should not have features that trap the player, etc. When trying to ensure that these conditions are satisfied, we can easily run into computational problems that simply take too much time to compute for a uh, uh, computer memory to solve. Um, for example, suppose that we want to make a puzzle game based on the traveling salesman problem. In this, uh, we would generate a map with a set of random cities and challenge the player to find the shortest route that, that visits them all. Um, finding such route is well known to be a computationally intractable problem, blah, blah, blah. Required. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While trying to find a work of this problem, there are a few more conditions. Each random sample should give a unique player experience. That experience should be fun. Yeah. This can be even tricky to satisfy since here we run into the 10,000 bowls of oatmeal problem. What is that? What is that? So, is way too long, maybe 10,000. Ah, oh, here you go. Oh, my test failed. Can I retry, resume? So your algorithm may generate <laughs> these amount of planets. They may each be subtly different, but as they, the player is exploring them rapidly, um, they will be perceived uh, will they be perceived as, the, uh, as different? I like to call this problem the 10,000 balls of oatmeal problem. I can easily generate 10,000 balls of, oat, of plain oatmeal with each oat being in a different position, different orientation, and mathematically speaking, they will be all completely unique, but the user will likely just see a lot of oatmeal. Perceptual uniqueness is the real metric, the real metric, and it's darn uh, tough. In some situations, just perceptual difference is enough and an easier bar to clear. Perceptual differentiation is a feeling that the piece of content is not identical to the last. The user glancing at a line of trees can tell if they are identical or if they are less varied than expected, suggesting unnaturalness. This fulfills an aesthetic need even if no trees are particularly memorable. Okay. Yep. To the point. Oh, so again, you don't, you didn't see what I just read. Perfect. I have to get used to the fact that I'm. So that's what I was reading <laughs> here, yeah, exactly here. So I have to get used to the fact that I'm recording on a tab. Um, so now we're back here. Uh, oh, come on. Why did I even go to the link? This shows the danger of content that is too random. Uh, so each sample is unique. It's unique in ways that humans don't notice or care about. I get some problem for content is not random enough. Humans are adept at pattern recognition. If we simply remix the same few blocks, players will soon see through the facade. Um, the illusion of infinite content will be broken. From the computing perspective, being not random enough is a good thing. 
if generation of puzzle puzzles labels another content has some structure to it, analysis of the content can make use of that structure. This makes it easier to ensure that our puzzles are solvable, our levels are completable, and to compare our player solutions to the best that is possible. Mm -hmm. Boring, yeah. Balancing all of these conflict requirements, how quantum computers can help. Quantum competition is a, is a new architecture for computing, allowing completely different approaches. Um, tractable, blah, blah, blah. I'm not, this is just basic stuff. Uh, this means we can start a look at how it might be applied to problems of random content generation. Okay. Uh, we already know exactly what the software will be able to do. Well, do we? For example, let's think again about a traveling salesman game uh, or how we like give the player while they are working at the solution we can use a quantum computer to determine the best solution possible means if we direct the player's efforts the same is true for many other kinds of problems that are relevant for randomly generated content quantum computers can also generate of random content itself these devices can be thought of as extremely fancy random number generators which can generate random distributions that no normal computer even could um, for example, Shor's algorithm takes an integer and computes its prime factors at the heart of its essential kind of process that takes an integer as a seed and then speeds out random factors of that integer. Computing these factors would take exponential effort for a normal computer, and so it becomes practically possible for large numbers, but quantum computers will be able to do without breaking a sweat. Shor's algorithm shows that quantum computers will be able to produce random solutions to computationally hard problems, generating good puzzles levels of or terrain for a game can also mean producing random solutions to computationally hard problems. That okay, um, but how do you do the ah? So there is indeed here. Okay, some code. Interesting. Um, in the rest of this article, we'll create a proof of principle. We'll make some randomly generated but but player pleasing content that can be built. It can be used within a game. We'll show that it can be done in the current era of quantum computing, which means using, using simulators and prototype quantum hardware. And we'll show that it can be done fast enough to fit in a loading screen. With this, we'll show that the era of generating random content in the quantum is away is here, not coming soon, not decades away. It's something we can start doing now. Um, could do the MSO as a proof of principle to show that playable content can be quickly generated and so as blah, 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 experiment with quantum computing for that. Yeah. So this is going to involve some coding and occasional bit of mathematical notation will move over to Jupyter Notebook. You'll find it in the box below. Okay, so we're here. And we're here. Can I open that in a, uh, let's see, open link in a new tab and then I'll copy paste it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh cool. So give me a second, cause it's gonna be easier to read, I guess. Um, so, uh, in this first experiment, we will look at one of the simplest and most useful, uh, Times of content to generate hate maps. We'll store these as Python dictionaries whose elements z, x, y will store the hate at position x, y. Okay. Rather than just printing these dictionaries to screen, it would be nice to see them as an image. So let's define a couple of functions to do that hate to image. Okay. For terrain. Non, this is a black and white image. Z x y equals one and black for z x y equals zero. Otherwise, the the values in terrain are used as thresholds between C and beach, beach and grass, etc. Uh, Okay. 
Now we can look at an example of how HeyMams are usually created. A popular approach is gradient noise, such as the simplex noise generated by the function below. Simplex created with HeyMap for an L for an L0 times L1, image using simplex noise. Simplex noise. The input L determines the size of the resulting image. We'll make a height map, height map of 500 by 500, undulating landscape with hills in white and valleys in black. Mm, the per period is, oh, this is controlled by the input period. Um, okay. Um, what are these still? Um, the, 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 the terrain. This uh, smooth and terrain zero, terrain one, terrain. The values in terrain are used as thresholds between sea and beach, beach and grass, etc. Uh, in terms of what? Color? Yeah, I guess that's color. Okay. Because if it's none of these, so it's none, then it's like, okay. Okay. Yeah, and so that's the, the RGB, I guess, of that position. Okay. Um, so we've got this here, whatever that does, to get something more like a real mountain range, gradient noise of different frequencies can be combined with different weights. As a simple example, let's make a mix with 80% of the same frequency, we saw before 20% of a higher frequency. It is our aim to come up with something similar using quantum computing. First, we need to choose how many how many qubits to use. If we want to perform a simulation within the time scale of a loading screen or to use a current prototype device, we shouldn't use too many. Let's start with 10. We want to use a small number of qubits, but we also want to generate images with thousands of points. To allow this, we can use the randomness that can appear in outputs of quantum computation. Specifically, um, for n qubits, the output is always a string of n and b. This means 2 to the power of n possible outputs. If the output has some randomness, this will be described by 2 to the power of n corresponding probabilities. This exponential number can allow us to squeeze as much as we can out of the, our, our qubits by associating each bit string with a point, and the height of the map at that point can be used to define the probability uh, of the string, okay. Ah, okay. So basically, you would run a quantum circuit like I don't know, if I say say a thousand times, and then each of the possible solutions is a point in the map. And their probability that you've observed with these thousand runs is the height. Yeah. The problem with this is getting all the heights out of quantum program. This will require many repetitions to do statistics on the output and calculate the probabilities. We refer to this as the number of shots. Yeah, exactly. The exponential number of shots required means that this method is not scalable to large n. It has exactly the kind of exponentiality increase in runtime the quantum computers usually aim to free us from. The method we use will serve as proof of principle for the current era. Quantum computer. Future areas will need different methods. Okay. For now, we need to choose a way of assigning each of the possible bit strings to a point. The most natural way to do this would be respect the humming distance of the bit strings. Um, this is because the basic operations of quantum computing single qubit gates and Control X gates only have the effect of flipping a single bit in a string. The strings that differ by only a single bit can therefore be regarded as closer to each other than those that differ by more. Okay. Mm, with this in mind, we'll set all the NB strings represented the hypercube shape that exists in an. 
this is a bit exotic for our needs since we want to turn it to the turn map we therefore need a way to squash a hypercube into to the surface um, this is done by the following in the following cell the dictionary strings is created with which has 2d coordinates x and y as keys to, and the corresponding bit strings as values the squashing procedure essentially uses the fact that a cube is two squares with each point in one connected um, a tesseract what is a tesseract <laughs> Then two cubes connected similarly, and so for the high dimensional hypercubes. But if we don't include all the possible connections, we can keep our not quite a cube flat and then do the same with the corresponding not quite a terrace tesseract and so on. The result is a square lattice. The four neighbors at each point are the four of the n hypercube neighbors are the corresponding strings so the strings are only close to strings that they should be close to and not at the cost of being far away from some of their hypercube neighbors okay yeah So, um, I paused away for a second, so I kind of lost where I was. Okay, yeah, so there's a mapping between what the different beat strings map to what place in the map, which is sort of a squeezed hyper dimensional cube, hyper, hyper cube. <laughs> um, We'll be using keys keys kit to do our quantum computation, which gives an output as a count dictionary. How many other shots repetitions? It's going to uh, There's are therefore essentially unnormalized estimates of the probabilities of each bit string. To convert a count dictionary into a height height map, we'll simply set the height of a point to be the counts value of the corresponding bit string an option to use the logarithm instead will also be included with a normalized uh, that's probably for cases where those amplitudes are too low too small um, we then normalize the hate uh, hate map to make a ma make the maximum hate equal to one and the minimum equal to zero Uh, okay, const of height, normalize height. We also need a method that will turn a height map into the input for a quantum computer. Why? Why the input? Uh, these inputs are quantum states which are expressed as list of two part of n values we don't get into technicalities of quantum states here the values in this list are known as amplitudes and that the j amplitude corresponds to the b string mm. Specifically, if we were to run the quantum computer immediately after loading the input, the amplitude of each string would be the square root of the probability of that string appearing in the output. And to achieve this for our height map conversion, we um, set each probability to be the square root of the corresponding height value. Then we normalize to make sure that all probabilities add up to one. Yeah, but I thought the amplitudes you were getting out of the quantum computer, they were already normalized. Am I getting lost in here, or there is... Uh, and where's the quantum circuit here? 
to test how our, and this new function is a simplex nice to make a hate map, generate a grid and associate its position to a bit string, then create the corresponding quantum state. Okay, so that's just a test. Uh, I've printed the original hate map without all the conversions, but at least it seemed to work. Now this is something useful. We'll make a simple hate map with arbitrary chosen points scattered here and there. We could generate this randomly, manually. We'll do this with Jupyter widgets. Rebox. Uh, as set up by the function below. Using this, we'll make a grid of buttons, one for each pixel, each is dark by default. Uh, so we're creating a heat map of what do we want to have in terms of terrain type. Mm. Can I actually get that? running on a Jupyter notebook. I thought those things were running uh, directly. No, no, the source block, no. Uh, can I, can I not, like, oh, no, sorry, that's not, that's not what I want. I thought you could interact with those directly in GitHub. Uh, can I? What if I fork it? I probably shouldn't have done this. Shouldn't have done this properly. Um, doesn't seem to. Yeah, I thought you could, you could do that. Let me just uh, see. Give me one second. Let me just go through that first quickly, then maybe, maybe we'll just load this. Um, where was I? Here. So, yeah, then you're making the points. This will be used as the seat. This will be used as the seat for what I'm calling quantum tartan. For this, we convert the seat into a state that, into a state to be used as input. Ah, okay. So you're going to create a state. I see. So you're going to create a state based on that and then shoot it into the quantum computer, apply some transformations, and then read out the probabilities. Okay. Mm. Uh, it will blur the seed using quantum interference. Okay, so the whole purpose of this is just to blur the edges so they smoothly transition between types of terrain. For this, we convert. Okay. For this, we convert the seed into a state to be used as an input. Then a simple quantum program is run to blur the seed using quantum interference. The output is then turned into a hate map. The following function does this using a simulator by default to use a real device. Blah blah blah. Uh, uh, the C argument of the function is the hate map generated above. The theta argument controls the amount of quantum blur uh, that is applied. A pre-made grid can be supplied to the function, or you can just let it generate one itself. So let's try to figure out what is the actual quantum circuit.
just Y rotations. Also, it's just a Y rotation on one. But how do you, what is the input? How is the seed? How do you make the seed? Make grid state height, height to state. Where is this defined? I missed it. Converts the HEMAP into a quantum state. Now, this is way earlier. Method will turn the HEMAP into an input for quantum computer. These inputs are quantum states, which are expressed as a list of two power of n values. We won't get into the technicalities of quantum states. Ah, so it actually turns that into. Ah, now I get it. That's why I was confused about normalization and all that stuff. Okay, so it actually takes. It turns it into the vector state that you see if you go to the IBM. Uh, let me see if I can show you IBM. Hue experience. It's been a while since I went there. Uh, 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 uh. Maybe they've made some updates to the circuit composer. I don't know if it's going to load because I'm on a bad network. Uh, oh, there's some, some, I see some different loading. Interesting. New circuit. Clear. Yeah, so this is the this vector here. I guess that's what's that's what's happening. Dun, 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 dun. That's the vector that, that you're supplying. I mean not this one, but the squared of these. And then that's why they normalize it, make sure that it makes sense. Have they changed anything here so far? Not much. Measurement properties. There's still some errors. Okay, info. Device is more. You can create a circuit and choose registers without selecting a backend, but you can receive your circuit to real hardware. Okay, the code. So, going back to where we were, good, so it takes that, um, hit the state. Um, Here, the seed and the greed. What is the greed? Make greed. Make a dictionary for whichever point in the greed is assigned a beat string. These are assigned. okay. So this is the this is the one that just makes it. Okay. Ah. Uh, Then it does the hate hate to st state here. No, here. Okay, so basically, 
the amplitude is the square root of whatever is in the z in the state yeah and then make sure that it's normalized okay and so it takes one state and then all the circuit does is apply a y rotation because it gets a circuit it initializes the circuit with the state and then just applies a y rotation uh, which depends on theta theta that was np Back end, the back end. This is all just you know getting the back ends and whatever, and then getting the jobs, and then basically you get the counts and then counts to height. Uh, okay. Now my question is, why would a Why would a Y rotation blur? I mean, if this is the C and then they use the same one, here's an example, that's definitely not. So, current job initiated, running current grid is the fastest in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we need a funny guy as by choose. Okay. So, we can use the fact that there are many ways to squash a hypercube. The grid used to generate the image above is not unique, and we can easily get more by simply shuffling all the Bead values. This is done by following the functions in order to generate a new shuffled version of the height map. Okay. Shuffle grid, shuffle height, shuffle, yeah. Despite the shuffling, the quantum tartan will always have a definite grid like pattern. This is not ideal if we're trying to generate something natural looking like terrain. We'll therefore make use of the following function, which rotates a height map by a given angle expressed by radians as a multiple of pi. The height map is also made bigger to make sure the image isn't clipped. Okay. For the 10 qubits we've used, the images we're generating are 32 per 32 pixels. That's not really enough to make something like a map in which we can play a game. A world, a world in the Raspberry Pi version of Minecraft, for example, is 256 per 256 block size. To make such a world, we can weave together many patches of quantum tartan. For example, let's make 100. Uh, ten, ten. Now we choose where we're gonna software running. Okay, where am I here? Next, we'll create a heat map Z. Sets which will contain the basic features of the final terrain. Again, this will be input manually. After running the cell below, we put some white points in the resulting map where you want high ground to be. The more points you put in the area, the higher the ground. Now you choose where you want the low ground to be under a close to sea level. Your inputs give us the following very basic map. Now we apply blur on this to smooth it out. Okay, but now here we've got it. No, what, what blur? Blur. Okay, but that's, that doesn't have any quantum stuff in it. That's just classical blurring.
Now we can define the function that generates our map. This will randomly sample points on the map with a probability proportional to the corresponding height. Patches of quantum tartan are then placed in these positions to create the terrain. For tartan in tartan, so for each block, for each portion of the map we're doing, I don't know, islands. The entire computational time required for this is under a minute. It's a reasonable time scale for loading for loading screen. If I want to use, uh, it would be nice to do more than just look at 2D maps to actually be able to explore the terrain. This can certainly be done, but it isn't simple to do so in Python. If we wanted to use a voxel-based game engine, such as MindTest, we would need to know which kind of block to put at each 3D location in the world. The following functions do exactly this. The first creates a dictionary with 3D co coordinates as keys and strings, this kind of material type of the off as values. Okay. So that basically makes the blocks. That's not probably worth diving into the how. Mm. But what is this? Grass with trees. The roof is always a mineral. Sand at H and then water up to sea level. Sand and water source. What is this H? Ah, it's the height of a block. Okay. Yeah, that's just classical stuff just to make the blocks work out and then and then you can save the blocks and probably run this in mind test. Okay, okay, but so this is just the the quantumness of this is, I mean, this is just um, using the random nature of, of of quantum computers because the 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 the, 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 the um, Quantum circuit here it just applies a Y rotation. Um, where is that measure here? Okay. Uh, So it initializes the state. Which can be a superposition because basically that's what you're doing, right? So you're turning. I'm trying to mentally process that, but you're turning. When you say like, the height to the state, that's what you're doing. You're actually creating a superposition. You're encoding a superposition, so you're just then using Kiski to initialize that. Um, ba, 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 ba. And, and then you just apply a Y rotation. And it, that's supposed to do what? Smoothen out things? That doesn't smoothen out things. Things that just messes up stuff. Uh, how are those dots? Okay, so the idea is. So the only thing that that basically keeps me into looking into this is that what's the what's the effect of that of that rotation
because for this we convert the seed into a state to be used as input. Then a simple quantum program is run to blur out the seed using quantum interference. That's why it's a, a, a Y rotation because it's the same. It's the same. It would have the same effect like as a Hadamard, right? So you're rotating. Interference. The output is then turned into a hate map. Hmm. I want to try to run that uh, the Jupiter C V uh, can play with this theta a little bit, but I'm quite surprised that. Uh, So we're supposed to see those things are supposed to be because here there's a lot of them, and so it's supposed to be this part in here, and then there's like like a bunch of points in here that make that right. But at the end of the day, I I wouldn't call that blur blurring. I mean that's kind of confusing because um, I don't think that's what's happening. Something like that. To blur out the seat. Mm. Okay, so how can I run that? How can I run that? So, can I just download it and then see if I can? No. Save, download, zip. And so what I'm looking at is uh, I thought you could play this. I thought you could do this with GitHub. Why you cannot? You could go into 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 interactive mode. Um, give me a second. Jupiter browser interactive. Now, wait a second. There is a demo. Let me open that up. There's like a, a compact version of that. Um, what? Why not? I just copied from, from another page. Uh, Let me go back to here and let's see if I can find the island generation thing. Or this is this is the binder. I where did I find that? I found it by looking at the CSV to terrain repository. And so let's see if that works out. Um, so, okay, so now it's interactive, so I can, and that's the whole, so that's the whole thing. How does this work? You do like that and it's running? Doesn't work. 
work. Is it still? Uh, I want to run this. Module not found error. So let me just no module peel. I'm I'm just okay. I'll probably I'll I think I'll what I should probably do is switch. I should probably switch to um, to Ubuntu. Play with this a little bit more. Why I cannot install that? That doesn't seem to work. Uh, No model name image. Okay. Um, starting repository, need a binder. Uh, maybe I need to wait. Okay, that un installs stuff. Okay, I need to wait. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pause that for a second, and then I'll uh, resume resume the recording once this is installed. Somehow I can't get that to work, but I found these here in this repository, which is a, a nice statement. So basically, it's, I, I think James is kind of discussing what are the effects of, of, of different circuits, and that's what I want to play with. So it says, on the other extreme, a circuit with a hard mark on all qubits creates a very smooth result. Okay, a circuit with one or a blank circuit or one with far fewer gates than there are qubits will lead to a very spiky result um, because some results will be likely, more likely, but most will be very rare. Uh, this means basically yeah, if you're not creating a, uh, a nicely smooth kind of superposition you're, uh, or, or distribution of results, you're going to get something that's like a really spiky terrain, right? Um, to make this more obvious, we will make the output of a circuit into an island. A smooth or spiky distribution will give a smooth or a spiky island. A distribution that shows interesting features of quantum interference, however, will have a more interesting texture. Okay, I, I just wanted to play with that, so I'll probably switch to um, uh, an Ubuntu machine and then uh, try to play with that directly there. Basically. Uh, see how that works, but that's going to be for the next video. Cool.